Hello and welcome to the Exponential View podcast. I'm Azim Azar, the creator of the Exponential View and your host today. In today's podcast, I'm in conversation with Andrew Yang, a former tech entrepreneur who is now putting himself in the running to be the Democratic candidate for the 2020 US presidential election. His platform includes a policy for universal basic income, which we explore during the podcast. But before we get to that conversation, let me tell you about Exponential View. It's my way of explaining how the world is changing under the force of technology. The podcast, These Conversations with Some Brilliant Minds, is one avenue. The other is through my free newsletter, A Wonder Missive, which lands in your inbox every Sunday. If you haven't subscribed, you can find it at www.exponentialview.co. That is www.exponentialview.co. In today's conversation with Andrew, we do discuss the state of the US, in particular the regional economic employment and opportunity impacts of automation and the concentration of power within the major technology players. Andrew knows his material. He's toured the US extensively and recently published a book, The War on Normal People, which looks at how technological change could drive a tsunami of unemployment. I should warn you that this podcast was recorded over an international line and the sound quality is not perfect. Our conversation was really great, though, so please enjoy it. For the next few weeks, the Exponential View podcast is sponsored by Spotify. I'm a massive fan of Spotify, and they've now added another killer feature, a podcast hub where you can get your favorite shows, including this one. So next time you launch Spotify, search for Exponential View and pick up the next episode there. So I'm delighted to have uh, with me on the podcast today, Andrew Yang, who is uh, the founder of Venture for America and is running to become the Democratic presidential candidate for 2020 in the United States. Andrew, it's really great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Azim. So where are you today? Are you in the, on the West Coast? Uh, are you on the East Coast in D.C., perhaps? I'm going to be in D.C. tomorrow, but uh, today I'm in um, my campaign headquarters in New York City. I was just in the Midwest yesterday in Iowa um, and Chicago, not both yesterday, <laughs> but uh, I've been on the, the road for last week and just got back late last night. Yeah, I think when you're running for elected office, a national elected office in the U.S., you really become a road warrior. Yes, and the road takes you in particular to Iowa and New Hampshire because our, our electoral process is such that those votes count much, much more than other votes. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I remember watching the, the West Wing, that amazing TV series uh, with uh, Martin Sheen a few years back. And uh, isn't it... Um, Manchester, New Hampshire, or something where some of the earliest results get announced, and it tends to be a bellwether for the, how, the, how the presidency is going to uh, proceed? Yeah, we're looking at most likely a crowded field on the Democratic side this time. So let's call it literally 15 to 25 candidates. And uh, by the time Iowa and New Hampshire are done voting, uh, that number will probably get whittled down to five or six. So, so to give you an idea of how important those states are. Right. Understood. And, and uh, tell me, how have you ended up putting yourself into this position? It's an arduous journey getting a presidential nomination, let alone winning the election. And you are not a politician uh, by trade. That's not where your previous success has come from. Just give us a flavor of your history. Yeah. Well, so uh, I rewind pretty far back. Um, I, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I've worked in technology uh, mm -hmm. and business and, and education startups over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, I was the head of an education company that was acquired by the Washington Post in 2009. And this was in the wake of the financial crisis. And uh, I was quite despondent about the direction of the company. So I, I thought about what I could do to help. And being an entrepreneur, what I thought the country needed was more entrepreneurs. So I started an organization called Venture for America that recruited and trained enterprising young people to help grow businesses in Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Birmingham, New Orleans, and other cities across the country. I, I donated uh, a bit of money to see the organization and then worked on that for the last seven years. Uh, and so I saw a lot of the country I had not seen before. And um, much of the Midwest and the South is still reeling from the automation of manufacturing jobs, where if you take Detroit as an example, that, that city had a peak population of 1.7 million, and now it's down to about 680,000 um, because of the decimation of manufacturing. So, uh, yeah, so, so imagine doing that job for 
uh, seven years and then feeling like you're pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. Um, and so, uh, and that all came to a head when Donald Trump became president in 2016. Right, because I, th- I think what you've described there are, are two uh, sort of fundamentally interesting things. One is that automation has been uh, taking hold uh, of modern economies for quite a long time, and it's definitely impacting uh, tr- communities that in the previous 50 years had had very high standards of living and high levels of unemployment. But the second thing that's interesting is that you've taken your entrepreneurship roadshow um, to cities that don't normally come to mind when you think about entrepreneurship in the United States. You know, when you say that to me, I, I think immediately uh, San Francisco and, and the Bay Area and Austin and New York and, and Seattle. Uh, that That's obviously a d- deliberate uh, decision on your part. And I think you've written about it in a couple of books as well. Yeah, so th- th- my thought was that we needed to have more ent- entrepreneurship and innovation and economic growth in other parts of the country. So we deliberately sought out um, cities that weren't experiencing a native influx of talent um, from college graduates every year. And how, how broken is it, um, Andrew, really? How broken is it when you go to those cities that hadn't been having an entrepreneurial boom over the last 15, 20 years? It, it's very extreme. It's very, very disparate. I mean, different parts of the U.S. are experiencing completely different economies, truthfully, uh, Azim. And, and some of the markets you talk about, Austin, Seattle, um, I saw a stat where literally uh, 80% of the new business growth occurred in 20 counties, not even 20% of counties, but 20 counties <laughs> in the United right. States. So the, the money is pouring in uh, to certain regions, and it's uh, spiking the cost of living and other things in places like San Francisco and Seattle. But in other parts of the country, um, it's a very, very different story. And I was blown away by just how disparate it is. Yeah. And, and you describe this, I think, in one of your, uh, your books as the six places. You say there is, you know, when you look at the talented coming out of the, uh, the education system, the expensive education system of the U.S., uh, there are essentially six jobs that they, they go for and they go to six cities. Um, the challenge, I guess, one, one I wonder about is in a knowledge intensive economy, don't you, doesn't that economy need knowledge intensive workers who it's going to reward um, and then reward them in the places where they want to live? Well, you know, and it, it, it is true that uh, both human capital and financial capital um, have been converging in a handful of cities in the U.S. And, I, you know, I experienced the, um, both sides of it, I'd say, throughout my career where, you know, I, I've built businesses on the coast and then I, I spent the last seven years um, in parts of the country I frankly had not been to before. Uh, and so when Donald Trump won in 2016, that to me was a giant signal, a red flag, where when I dug into the data, I found that uh, there was a direct correlation between the adoption of industrial robots uh, and the movement towards Trump in each voting district. And uh, I grew to believe that Donald Trump is the manifestation of the fact that we're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transition uh, in our history, and that it's going to get darker and nastier as we automate away more and more of the most common jobs. And most of that will be felt in these parts of the country um, you know, the, the Midwest and the South, um, to a lesser extent than the coastal markets that uh, your friends and mine might spend most of their time in. Right. And, uh, you know, this idea is Donald Trump effectively uh, reflecting that malaise is is quite a, a, a powerful one. I mean, he was you know, clearly elected, had a tremendous amount of, of support, and it seems to drive from the hollowing out of a large part of the, the sort of economic heartland. But the thing that struck me is that while this has been happening, the U.S. has got uh, wealthier and wealthier. I mean, I think GDP per capita is uh, somewhere between fifty-five and sixty thousand dollars a year. So the issue is not about the the generation of wealth or the generation of value. The issue has been about the way uh, the U.S.'s political culture has sort of decided it wants to distribute it. Isn't isn't it? Um, w- well, you know, if you were generous, you would say that uh, that, that um, it's been decided for us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in, in terms of just the mechanics of how capital is being distributed in a winner-take-all economy and you have a handful of markets that um, are, are hoovering up a lot of the gains. So you talk about the GDP per capita, and that is going up. But if you look at the indicators around uh, the average American, they're, they're, they haven't gone anywhere. Where median wages haven't moved in decades for the average American, 57% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
the labor force participation rate has actually declined to a multi-decade low of 62.9%, the same levels as El Salvador and the Dominican Republic. Uh, and one in five prime working age American men hasn't worked in the last 12 months. So the, those numbers are very consistent with what you'd expect if we were automating away many of the low skilled jobs. And the, the GDP number uh, to me is going to be increasingly misleading because with the arrival of AI and autonomous vehicles, GDP will probably uh, keep on going up even as more and more Americans get pushed out. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And you know, you, what, what you've described there is we can already start to, to see in the, the spread. I mean, the median uh, wages are staying where they are. I think the median wage of someone at Facebook is $240,000 a year. So that clearly is well, you know, well above the, the, na- the national median. Um, and, and that seems to be the, the natural outcome of the way in which the rules have previously been written. Uh, and, and so, so I, one of the questions I, I wonder w- about is if we can observe these as symptoms, what are the steps one needs to take to uh, correct them, right? What is the the, the, the treatment for it, if the treatment isn't um, a sort of an isolationist uh, a- anti-trade platform, what is, what is the treatment? Well, you know, you can't freeze time or uh, turn the clock backwards so that your only choice is to accelerate and try and move society forward. So a lot of the solutions that other political figures are suggesting are based on an economic understanding that no longer applies And what they believe is that if you have economic growth and companies grow, then they have to hire lots of people and treat them well in order to successfully compete. And what we found is now companies can grow to become very successful without hiring lots of people. And if they do hire people, uh, they'll tend to be temporary gig or contractors, uh, contract workers. 94% of the new jobs created since 2005 have been uh, contract and, and temp workers. So Uh, the rules are breaking down and the policy prescriptions of the past are not going to work because if you get a company to grow, it may or may not actually move wages uh, or benefits in a meaningful way. Right. I mean, that's what we've seen uh, fundamentally is on the one hand, you have Facebook, which is a very successful company, doesn't employ a lot of people considering its value. And on the other hand, you have uh, these platforms like Uber, which are very effective at, I I guess, mapping um, available labor with uh, available demand for that labor, uh, but the the va- the bulk of the value is actually captured by the platform rather than the people doing the work. Yeah, and so to me, the most effective thing we could do, and and the the central pillar to my plan as a presidential candidate, is the freedom dividend, uh, which is a universal basic income plan where every American adult between the ages of eighteen to sixty four gets a thousand dollars a month, uh, free and clear, no questions asked, um, and this would be an incredible boost to dynamism, mobility, entrepreneurship. Uh, the Roosevelt Institute projected that it would create uh, four to four and a half million new jobs a year and that uh, the economy would grow by about 12% or two and a half trillion dollars um, also in perpetuity. Uh, because right now, again, if 57% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill, we know that they're going to spend the vast majority of this thousand dollars a month right there um, in their uh, communities and towns. I, I, absolutely. When you think about universal basic income, which is a topic uh, I touched off uh, in my previous podcast series with uh, Scott Santens, who is uh, sort of one of the authorities in, 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 in the field, there are always two objections that people, that people raise. And I'm sure listeners are thinking about this as well. The first is, um, you know, how do you, how do you pay for it? And the second is, how does it really benefit someone's, uh, how do we know that it will generous, generally benefit someone's well being and won't just go on buying skins for a video game like Fortnite or uh, on opioids? Well, Scott probably talked about this at at length, but to your earlier point, our economy is up to a record $19 trillion, up $4 trillion in the last 10 years alone. I mean, we are the richest, most advanced society in the history of the world, and we can easily afford this in the scheme of our economy. Um, the, The big change we would need to make, in my opinion, is that we need to be in better position to harness the gains from AI and autonomous vehicles and, and uh, all the other innovations coming down the pike because the main benef- beneficiaries of those innovations are going to be global technology companies that are great at not paying a lot of tax. And so we're going to be in a bind where more and more work gets done 
uh, by machines and our tax revenue is not going to reflect that. So the big change we need to make is that we need to join every other industrialized country in the world and have a value added tax. And because our economy is now so vast at $19 trillion, even a relatively moderate VAT at half the European level would generate enough money when combined with current spending on welfare programs, new tax revenue from economic growth, and cost savings on things like incarceration, homelessness services, and healthcare, that we could afford a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month. Yeah. Uh, but that is a big change we need to make. We need to stop discouraging labor in any form. Like I would be for, over time, trying to get away from income taxes that are based upon labor arrangements and move more and more towards a, a value-added tax. Right. And you're, you're, just give me a sense of how you see that working. A half of European rate is about 10%. Uh, would you see it being applied sort of consistently across the things that people and companies could buy in, in the economy? Yeah, it would be very broad. And you have to keep in mind that every dollar and then some is getting uh, returned to the American people. So um, if we put money into their hands, and this goes to your second question, um, both common sense and the data uh, show what, that people would uh, have better nutrition, better mental health, uh, higher graduation rates, lower domestic violence, lower stress levels, lower hospital visits. Uh, one study showed that if you were to alleviate child poverty in the U.S., uh, you would increase GDP by $700 billion based just on better health, um, educational outcomes, uh, and worker productivity. So they're, they're all tied together where if we put this money into people's hands, it's going to grow the economy, but it's also going to shore up our human capital, which is very much heading in the other direction. I, it, it, it's so interesting. Uh, the, the, some of the studies that you, you've alluded to a couple uh, there, and there have been others that I've read, which um, show that you know, financial stress uh, actually has a correlation with poor examination uh, performance as well. Yeah, the study you're thinking of, I mean, it lowered performance on an IQ test by 13 points, which is almost one standard deviation. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and actually, that is really, that's the difference of maybe 100 years of the... Uh, of better nutrition, better education, um, and uh, decades of the Flynn effect in that, in that context. Yeah, I mean, if you look at America and you wonder what's happening, I mean, a mindset of scarcity has overtaken 57% of our population where they're lurching uh, week to week and paycheck to paycheck. And then if you ask them to be reasonable, optimistic, and, and future-oriented, um, it's unrealistic because they're just trying to keep their steps going ahead of them and if your executive functioning erodes, which is the case if you have a mindset of scarcity, you're more likely to make poor decisions, be impulsive, um, do things that, uh, as a society, you know, cost us all, um, and also make terrible political decisions, which is one thing we, we've seen with um, the election of Donald Trump. I, I, I'm curious about the choice uh, of, of universal basic income uh, in general as a way of reducing the stresses uh, on people's lives. So essentially giving them the respect and the freedom to make uh, good choices for themselves. Uh, isn't another approach to do that perhaps to have, uh, in, in a sense, universal basic services, the kind of things that you see, particularly in the Nordic model, but also in other parts of Northern Europe where, uh, you know, healthcare is available, education is available, there's great investment in public transport. So rather than spending, you know, 10 bucks on a cab, you, you, you get on a, on a, on a tram for, for a euro or so. And um, I mean, that's another way to alleviate stressors and give people a sort of compassionate society from which they can sort of achieve their potential. Well, I'm a fan of more robust social infrastructure, but one thing I really want to press on, which is that we've known for decades that between 70 and 80% of educational outcomes are, are uh, influenced by things outside of school. Um, so that's uh, mm -hmm. parental income, times, uh, time spent reading to the child, stress levels in the house, nature of the neighborhood and community. So if we keep putting money into schools and say they're going to turn, um, turn children's lives around, it's probably not going to work. And, and that's something that the U.S. has been suffering with for a long time. One thing that the U.S. has to start doing more of is investing in our people and trusting our people and not saying... Um, oh, if we just give money to the institutions, the institutions will be able to elevate the people because the facts don't indicate that that's going to work. Um, now, now, am I for things like better infrastructure, better roads, better social services, daycare, um, healthcare? Yes, I'm for all of those things. 
But in, in my mind, that approach will be fundamentally less effective than simply putting money into people's hands uh, and uh, have them make decisions as to how best to allocate it and use it. Yeah, I, I mean, I can I can see that argument as well. There's also just there's a lead time issue. It takes a long time to build a, a metropolitan transit system or a network of single payer hospitals. Uh, decades, in fact, to do that. Whereas you can start cash transfers um, more efficiently because I'm guessing a lot of that infrastructure is already in place at you know, federal and state level. Yeah, about half of Americans are already getting uh, checks and transfers from the government. And as my friend Andy Stern says, uh, the government is terrible at many, many things but it is excellent at sending large numbers of checks to large numbers of people promptly and reliably every month. So we have to lean into what our government's good at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, every organization has a core competence. So uh, that could yeah, be... Yeah, I mean, if we were to say we're going to rebuild the schools and like, you know, build up on like, you know, over a hall or healthcare system, I mean, that stuff would be very, very hard and, and the US government might make a hash out of a significant proportion of it. Um, yeah. But if we say we're going to... Uh, change our capital flows in a way that actually strengthens human beings and build a new new form of capitalism that has uh, human well-being at its core as opposed to capital efficiency because capital efficiency will increasingly advantage AI machines mm -hmm. uh, and things that uh, do not rely upon human labor. No, absolutely it will. And, and I think humans, is, I want to spend a bit of time on humans because you talked a bit about community uh, in, uh, in one of your previous answers. And, and you, know, you, you alluded to the fact that Detroit and many other cities have, have seen a, de a dehumanization in the sense that humans have literally left those cities. Uh, I think one effect we've seen over decades in the US has been um, the, the breakdown of, uh, the, the, the weakening of, traditional local and community structures. So, uh, you know, Robert Putnam had his series of books um, back in the, in the 90s uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the decline of community. And we've also seen with the rise of personalized news feeds across social media that people have less of a shared civic space. You know, you kind of stay in your red space or in your blue space or in your baseball space or in your, your hockey space, but you don't have that that kind of overlap that might have happened at the at the drive-in or at the uh, the bowling alley back in the in the fifties. Uh, how important do you think it is to reestablish that sort of um, localized trust if if those community structures have been weakened by the changes of the last thirty or forty years? Uh, it, it's vital, and uh, you can see it in the the data, really, in any indicator. And there's been a collapse in institutional trust and involvement for most Americans, uh, and now. With teenagers and smartphones, it's becoming even more generational. And so, uh, and this is going to make it seem like I think giving people money is the answer to everything. But, <laughs> but genuinely, if you think about it, um, if you put money into Americans' hands, a lot of that money is going to go back into um, local churches and NGOs and, and uh, nonprofits and community affairs, where in, in communities with more resources, then um, there's just going to be a lot more attention paid um, to the things that. Uh, will bring people together, including, for example, communal living arrangements, where if you have universal basic income and eight people get together and say, hey, with our $8,000 a month, we can like buy that, you know, <laughs> buy that fixer upper and get, get some stuff done. So uh, it, it will be very, very powerful. And there are very few ways to reverse this um, through other means because all of the forces are driving in the same direction. I'm just going to point out one that, that like I find very pressing is that a lot of America is becoming a local news desert because all these local newspapers are going out of business um, and there's a real replacement for them. So imagine being in a community where you don't have a newspaper that reflects what's going on and then you're, expo you're expected to democracy. I mean, um, that there are going to be a lot of changes that need to be made um, in order to preserve our current form of government effectively. Right. And, and just from, from the perspective of, of how you, you think about... Um solving those from a, a policy standpoint, it, uh, it, it sounded like you felt that because people benefit from those community institutions themselves, at the moment they have that, um, the, the dividend that you're, you're proposing, that kind of decentralized local investment can, can, can start again because there is actually some capital to put towards it and you can start to rebuild, maybe not the institutions of the past, but the new local community institutions that are fit for purpose for the 21st century. Is that it, or are there are other policy prescriptions that you think would, would work to, to rebuild those, uh, those, those sorts of local trust? I mean, I, I think putting the, this $1,000 a month into Americans' hands every month would be the most 
powerful thing, but I'm also for uh, public initiatives to shore up local journalism. I think America needs to invest in something like the BBC in the UK because there's been such a fragmentation uh, of our media and our political discourse. And like you said, there are these information silos and bubbles. So I don't think that money is the cure-all um, in various communities, but I, I would say it's the most powerful thing that we can realistically do that would be effective quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, can, can we turn to, uh, to one other sector that we haven't we've touched on, but I think is, has played an important part, which is the a growth of these large networked platforms, uh, you know, Facebook and, and Amazon and, 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 and so on, and the role that, that they play now as the intermediary controller and curator of the average citizen. Uh, you know, Netflix decides what you watch, Facebook decides the news that you read, uh, Amazon uh, essentially sits across the entirety of the, the, the commerce chain. What do you think the uh, the role of these platforms needs to be, and do they need to take on some new responsibilities, or or perhaps be strongly encouraged by, you know, legislation or the political process to take on new responsibilities? Yeah, you know, we're we're very much in uncharted territory in terms of the consolidation uh, of uh, so much of what we consume and see uh, through a handful of platforms, and our government is decades behind. I mean, you can tell like they barely know how Facebook works. But there's one guy who knows how Twitter works, let's be honest. Yes, and, and he managed to get elected president in part because he knew how Twitter works. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. Yeah. Um, so if you look at the nature of our political leadership, I mean, they're going to be decades behind the curve. I mean, like mm -hmm. the, some of the front runners um, for the Democratic nomination were born in the 40s. So if you think that they're going to be uh, ahead of what's happening in technology and AI, I mean, like we're electing the wrong people for that. It's one reason I'm running for president is right. that I believe technology is the most powerful transformative force in our society today. And I believe I have a much deeper understanding of what that's going to mean than anyone else who's going to be running for president. Uh, but part of it very much is trying to either partner with um, or intelligently uh, rein in some of the excesses that happen when so much uh, of what we see and consume is, is um, channeled through a handful of platforms. I will say too, that our antitrust regs, are based upon uh, an anachronistic understanding where they're just trying to, to guard against um, mm -hmm. And so if you look at it and say, well, things are free or near free or cheaper, then the government's like, well, that's great. Um, but then that's going to end up causing massive changes in other parts of the economy. And I'm not saying that those changes should necessarily be, um, be forestalled against because you know, I love progress. Uh, but we do have to get much more intelligent about it uh, in terms of our approach societally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you touched on on antitrust and, and antitrust having, at least in the US, not having great answers towards the, the, the power of, of, of Facebook and, and Amazon and so on. Uh, there's, there's another dimension, which I, I think of as the attention uh, di dimension. I mean, we know that uh, you know, the, the news feeds and the Netflixes and so on of this world are, the recommendation algorithms are designed to get us to stay on site. They trade on our attention, which is not something that is measured by the economists and the GDP statistics, but it is a scarce resource. We, you and I only have you know, 15, 16 hours of decent attention when we're awake uh, during the day. Um, we don't really have the tools for dealing with the, the sort of political economy of, of attention right now, do we? No, we, we really don't. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think back to when I was growing up where there were just a few TV networks and then every once in a while the government would be like, hey, we have an announcement, we have an address. And like now, now it, it's such a multitude <laughs> of entertainment options that, um, that, you know, it's hard to imagine. Um, but, but that is one of the things that's going to keep dividing us. And it also is breaking our political feedback mechanism where one of the things that's galvanized me is if you look at what's happened uh, throughout America with just the destruction of manufacturing jobs. So I studied economics in college. Um, mm. And I don't know, did you study economics? Azim? I did study economics. Yeah. But unfortunately, the, the economics I studied was, uh, you know, homo economicus and rational expectations and uh, lots of the stuff that has subsequently because of neuroeconomics and behavioral economics got much better frameworks uh, around. Uh, well, it's <laughs> mostly it, useless. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's great that you even uh, see it that way because, you know, so many people were trained um, the way, you know, I was trained the same way. Um, and so, according to my textbooks, if you were to 
automate away 4 million manufacturing jobs, those workers would um, retrain, reskill, and move for new opportunities, get higher productivity uh, jobs, and then the economy would grow. Uh, but then when I dug into the numbers, almost half of them left the workforce never to be heard from again. And of that half, um, about half filed for disability, where now mm -hmm. there are more Americans on disability than work in the construction industry. Right. Uh, and when I looked at the data around how effective retraining efforts were, um, they were entirely ineffective, where many of the independent studies found a 0% effectiveness rate and that less than 10% of uh, workers qualified for retraining anyway. So it's mainly a talking point and a fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so if you see what happened to the manufacturing workers, which led to a surge in suicides among Americans um, uh, between 50 and 59, right. to the point where our life expectancy has now declined for two straight years, mm -hmm. meet Americans dying of opiates every hour. Um, and so if you see that fact pattern between 2000 and 2015, um, and then you say, okay, what's going to happen to the three and a half million truck drivers? What's going to happen to the two and a half million call center workers? What's going to happen to the literally 10 million retail workers who make $12 an hour in our high school graduates? I mean, you can see very clearly what's going to happen. Um, and that's why we need to go very, very dramatically in another direction because our, our indicators are not, uh, they, we should be getting red flags right and left, but it's like we don't have a dashboard. Right. Yeah, we don't have a dashboard. And what, what I think we describe it as uh, is sometimes is the pitchforks moment. Uh, I think there's a scene in The Simpsons where the crowd, the town gets really angry and they all gather pitchforks. And, they, uh, and, and, and I think sometimes when I look at the US from my vantage point in London, but I even look at uh, Western Europe, you see the, some of these dynamics playing out in greater or lesser extent. And you think the, the mechanism is broken and we have to get in there and make some changes. Um, otherwise, the the only way through it is some very ha unhappy um, sch schisms uh, in in society, and and so so to st to step into that um, and fix it is important. But I, I I still wonder about how you repair a sense of well being um, and a sense of positivity uh, and ambition and potential uh, in such large numbers of people when the decline has been in been in, in set for 20 or 30 years i mean how that seems like a an enormous task it is an enormous task it's a generational challenge um it's not going to be solved uh in one day or even with one incredible policy like the freedom dividend mm. um and but that is the challenge we must undertake because if we do not then america will uh continue to erode and disintegrate from the inside out just a reminder, this podcast is sponsored by Spotify. I'm a massive fan of the service, and I'm delighted that Spotify has now launched a podcast hub. This means you can find all the episodes of the Exponential View podcast there, launch the app, and search Exponential View. Now, back to our conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. And the data around what happens to idle men, it was, what's fascinating is, I didn't realize how gendered it was, but women mm -hmm. who are out of work um, are essentially fine, where they, you know, they, they turn their energies to uh, community, education, volunteering, caregiving. Um, men, it's really clear that we are not fine if we are left idle. Mm -hmm. Unemployed men volunteer less than employed men. We right. um, spend 75% of our time on the computer, and we all know, what, you know, it's video games and, and pornography. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we turn to drinking, drugs, uh, gambling, vices, uh, self-destructive behaviors, and then tend to die early deaths. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what you're describing is the fundamental challenge is what do we do in a society where there are millions of unskilled men in particular and 50, like only 32% of Americans graduate from college. So we're talking mm -hmm. about essentially two thirds of the population. Mm -hmm. um, what are we going to do to create meaningful opportunities and touch points to keep men integrated into society and the economy? Um, and that you're a hundred percent, right? Like, that's going to be a, a monumental challenge for yeah. years and decades to come. But we need to get started because mm -hmm. if we don't get started, um, it's going to be undoable. Right. Well, it's, it, it's interesting because there seem to be two different um, uh, 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 barriers to achieving that. One is that there, is, uh, there needs to be a kind of a Keynesian stimulus, uh, a, a new New Deal, which could be about uh, 
you know, infrastructure, however we see it, whether it is um, solar plants and uh, wind turbines and, and improved roads and schools and th those sorts of things. Um, and that's really a matter of, of, of I, I would think, is of, of cash, some plans and some motivation. But the second uh, obstacle, I think, seems to be that a lot of the growth sectors are in uh, what have been called kind of caring or social or human to human uh, sectors, whether it is elder care or, or, or education. And those areas seem to have been heavily gendered once again. So the, 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 and there may be some socialization that says to people, well, you know, I used to be a, a man working as a, in an insurance company or in an auto repair shop. Um, I'm not going to go and take a, a, a job in a in an elderly community where I'm, you know, managing something because that's not ma man's work. I mean, those seem to be like two obstacles we need to think about. One of which is kind of economics and policy, and the other is about, um, you know, the values that, that exist within a society and what people believe is good work. Yeah, and, and and this is something where I diverge from some other thinkers on this is that um, to me it's a mistake to try and chase the market the big move we have to make, and I think you'll like this a lot, is we have to start measuring economic growth very, very differently. Because again, GDP um, is not going to reflect what's happening in our communities. And so if we expand uh, economic growth to include things like uh, childhood success rates and infrastructure and environmental sustainability and average income and wealth and proportion of elderly in quality circumstances and mental health and freedom from substance abuse, then we can create many more touch points in the economy that will lead to more forms of work that more people will be able to participate in. Um, and then my goal would be to create a whole new uh, currency and way to uh, monetize these behaviors to create more touch points in the economy for, frankly, uh, people that uh, right now may not be able to find those opportunities based on the monetary market. We need to create like uh, a, a more, and it's based on something called time banking that, mm -hmm. that you're probably familiar with where uh, my, like if I do something, like if I give you a ride or watch your children for an hour, then I get a time dollar. And then, uh, you know, with my time dollar, I can give it to, to a third person and then they'll do something for me. And so if you create that kind of ecosystem, then you have a chance to engage more people, particularly unskilled men in the economy in a meaningful way. It, it's it's a the the chat the interesting point about that is that it is a systemic change uh, within the way an, uh, a society works that is that is akin to providing unemployment insurance or extending uh, public education to you know to high school level. It, it is it is not a the, the kind of change that an administration would just introduce. Um, it's one of those pivotal moments where we say, listen, we need a new paradigm um, running forward. And that seems those, these ideas seem to be, there seem to be a few of those ideas in your uh, general approach to, to how you kind of resolve the, 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 the situation that we're in at the moment, that it's not about tweaking with the recipe that we had before. It's about introducing an entirely new set of uh, recipes. Is, is, that, is that a reasonable characterization? It's, it's, it's dead on because right now we're in a race that we cannot win. You mm -hmm. know, if you say, hey, the market is the determinant of human value uh, right. and the, the value of our time, then it's about to zero out uh, a few million truck drivers who right now, now make $45,000 a year. And then you say, hey, you, you, now you're worth zero. You know, so we need to have a different way to determine our own value because technology is going to zero out a lot of us. It's not just mm -hmm. going to be truck drivers. It's going to be lawyers and radiologists and like accountants and like on and on through yeah. the economy. And so we need to change the, the paradigm. And if you look at it, GDP didn't even exist until the great depression when they mm -hmm. were looking around saying like, why are things so bad? Like we need a number. And the inventor of GDP, Simon Kuznets mm -hmm. said, this would be a terrible measurement of national well-being, and we should not use it as that. Uh, parenting and motherhood should be included in GDP and national defense spending should not be. Um, right. So again, this was like a human invention that right. we now take as the guideposts for so much of what we do uh, in our economy. And it's almost a hundred years later, uh, we need a more nuanced, textured, human, three-dimensional uh, set of measurements that would actually tell us how we're doing. 
because yeah. right now we're being we're being blinded by uh, capital efficiency and GDP in the stock market, and things are disintegrating underneath our feet. What, what, what I think one of the the areas you can take opt, uh, some kind of optimistic uh, uh, feelings from is. As you say, these ideas were um, consensuses that were driven by from by a handful of people initially, and, and if we look at you know where American and British capitalism is at the moment, a lot of it is still being driven by Milton Friedman's uh, 1971 uh, position. You know, the, the social um, responsibility of a company is to maximize its profits for its shareholders so long as it stays within the rules of the game, and and that's driven a lot of this uh, monomaniacal thinking. I think that even led us to the global financial crisis and ultimately it, it you know is that is that the same level of of, of truth as a newtonian um law that describes uh, some mechanics uh, it, it's not it's a it's a social convention and it's a set of b- b- beliefs so the the optimistic reading is well we just need to find a new set of beliefs that we can ag- some of us can agree on or enough can agree on that we rally around but those also need they also need a flag bearer right before you get to the to the white house um It'll become clear to some quite wealthy uh, people, particularly those on the coasts um, in the six cities, the you know, the technologists of Silicon Valley, that any form of um, of redistribution is going to impact the, the the wealthiest. I mean, what's your reading about uh, the that that group and whether you know, technologists uh, and and entrepreneurs and the sort of that that community? recognizes the need to really change the way uh, fiscal policy and taxation policy is run and, and perhaps how it might impact them personally and whether they're willing to, to pay for that. Well, you and I were introduced by uh, one such entrepreneur, Misha Chellum, and right. dozens, almost hundreds of entrepreneurs and technologists have come aboard my campaign because they know that all of this is real. Uh, they're on the scene and they're still human beings. Uh, you know, most of them are parents. Um, and one thing, if you want to be just calculating about it, life outside the bunker is much better than life inside the bunker. <laughs> so so, uh, so uh, technologists are getting behind my campaign in very large numbers, uh, including some really, really well-known ones um, that, uh, you know, we're going to announce very, very shortly. So uh, it's, it's awesome. I mean, you know, one of the things that I, I say in my book is that it's beyond a technologist's capacity to try and figure out all of the downstream social impacts of what the work they're doing is. I mean, you know, they have hard jobs already. Um, That's not their job. It's our job. It's society's job. It's the government's job. And that's what I'm going to do as president. But the technologists are right behind me because they see the way the world is going and uh, they want to be part of the solution. Yeah. It's it's so, it's so interesting because they, uh, as you say, it's very hard to see the second or third order effects of the technologies that you that you build. Um, I think there is a there's a lot of discussion now about the nature of the ethics of technology. Having uh, like you worked in in startups and been a been a product manager uh, as well, I I question sometimes the the approach uh, of um, focusing on single metrics. I think large companies and have often done that. They focused on the single metrics really to the exclusion of their, their social responsibilities. And, and it seems to me that there is a way, an awakening about, a, around that uh, in the Bay Area, and maybe in a minority that people are starting to realize that, hey, we're not just building cool apps anymore. We're actually um, tinkering with the fabric of society. Yeah, and, and you have to look at it too, is that, uh, you know, Amazon, Google, like all the companies do better in a strong society where people have money to spend. I mean, if consumers don't have jobs and don't have money and are like killing themselves and rioting, I mean, that's bad for everyone. So, so this is very much just enlightened self-interest. You don't need to be a pure altruist to be on board with the fact that um, society will function much better when, when people uh, have enough to meet their basic needs and then can start thinking about, you know, broadening their, their own uh, value to society. Mm. One thing that that technology does seem to strain, um, <laughs> yet another thing, um, is is the nature of um, sort of international relations and the nature of uh, trade in particular. And, and we're seeing a couple of um, interesting um, things going on right now. One is this uh, national AI competition uh, that that some people are mooting with the Chinese having this integrated state um, uh, state private sector. Uh, thrust to build an intelligent economy by 2030. 
Um, and I think the second thing that we are seeing is that we don't have established red lines and rules for cyber meddling and cyber warfare. Uh, and that is creating situations where, I mean, there are many, many attacks across multiple different virtual borders that are encouraged by states, state-sponsored or literally done by states' military apparatus um, at, at the moment. How do you think uh, you would approach uh, those sorts of issues um, on the basis of you know, sitting in the White House in, in a few years' time? Well, I, I've met with uh, the folks in Silicon Valley at OpenAI. Um, I'm friendly with Kai-Fu Lee and read his new book, which I'd recommend. Um, yeah. And right now, the U.S. is in danger of being leapfrogged in AI by China, very, very mm -hmm. clearly, um, where China has access to more data. Um, central control is a real boon when you're, you're trying to uh, feed like, you know, unspeakable uh, amounts of data uh, into your algorithms. Um, and they can invest more in computing infrastructure than even the richest American company. I mean, we're talking about literally like $10 billion plus dollars that even the richest companies in the U.S. Like, might not have just to be able to fund um, research and development. So America needs to meaningfully invest in this. And one thing I've said to the folks in Silicon Valley is that I have a deal for you as president. We're going to give you a blank check, more or less, like within reason, but tens of billions of dollars for computing infrastructure that uh, we can all use to make sure that America is one of the or the leader in AI. But in return, what I'm going to ask is that we get some of the smartest people we can find just to represent the government, just to be around and hang out in the room. <laughs> you know, like, uh, so, so that and then so that will be the value proposition. Uh, but, but America needs to be at the forefront. And right now we're very much in danger. In, in all likelihood, it looks to me like China is going to strip us, like outstrip us in commercial applications uh, in the next like 10 to 12 years. Um, on the second, which I agree with as well, like we need to create to the extent possible some protocols around uh, cyber meddling and, and cybersecurity and hacking, particularly when it comes to our democratic processes. And if we fail in that, then we'd have to make very, very clear to certain powers if we can detect that you are tampering with our elections, then we are going to respond very, very unkindly. And the American people would 100% get behind that. It seems like you're suggesting that you need to do one of two things. So one is reinvest nationally in terms of national capability, uh, but encouraging the private sector to, to do that. Uh, but the second is that there needs to be uh, still a reliance on some kind of multilateral set of frameworks. You know, we had rules around uh, nuclear weapons. We had rules around biological and chemical weapons. Uh, we have we have rules around trade. Um, so we need to have rules uh, around uh, you know cyber interference uh, as well. And that that is perhaps a, a multilateralism that the U.S. has had less of since uh, 2016. Yeah, that, that is the direction we need to go. But I, I will say that multilateralism benefits when America is um, very, very strong in these areas. Um, so one thing I would also do is I'd try and build our capacities um, while trying to appeal to other countries to build a framework that we can all hopefully benefit um, without like the naivete. I mean, the, the truth is we need to invest a ton and be world class uh, to the extent possible in these disciplines. Yeah. Okay, that, no, that's that's quite helpful. There's there's another um, issue, of course, that it is that is um, sort of large scale um, and probably requires multilateral solutions, which is the the challenge of of climate change. And I get the sense that um, increasingly the climate scientists are saying that there are real impacts being felt by coastal communities around the world, including in the um, in in the U.S. Um, have you got a particular perspective about how that how important that issue is? Um, and how you would address it? Yeah, to, that to me is a top three existential level threat. Um, to me, the list goes uh, social disintegration due to the fact that we're automating away the most common jobs in the economy. That's more immediate in my mm -hmm. mind because we're already in the third inning of it. Um, number two would be AI, cybersecurity, infrastructure. Um, and then number three, tied for number two, um, is climate change. Uh, just because climate change, we have a little bit more time, but not really anymore, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I would invest uh, tens of billions of dollars in geoengineering projects because at this point, trying to slow the rate is, is a loser. I mean, you know, if our grandkids are suffering instead of our kids, is that like cause for celebration? Um, and so 
the plan to me would be to invest in solutions like, uh, for example, shoring up the base of glaciers with uh, earth that will slow down the rate of melting because mm-hmm. glaciers melt because warm water hits the base of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, expandable mirrored satellites that we can just like fold up or like unfold depending upon um, how we how we find them uh, to be working. Like things that are not permanent, things that are reversible and mechanical are preferred. But we need to start owning the fact that this is real, it's happening, uh, and try and find ways to mitigate the worst effects. Um, I would invest literally trillions in our infrastructure uh, to make it more resilient, but also uh, to try and move towards renewables. I mean, we have this fundamental issue that we have many, many uh, men we need to put to work, and we have a need to update our infrastructure, and we need to move towards renewables. So to me, having an army of people installing solar panels on rooftops around the country seems to me to, to be a win-win-win. Yeah, it, it does. And I found a sort of curious data point that uh, Texas was one of the top three states, I think, in the U.S. for, for solar production, uh, which, you know, of course, being the, the oil state as well and the oil capital uh, was curious, but it's really the market uh, talking about the maturity of that particular technology in a sense. Yeah, very much. I mean, you know, like people in energy um, are the most likely to in, invest uh, in, in all forms. Um, but at, at this point, unfortunately, I mean, the U.S. is less than 40 percent of emissions. Um, like we have to start getting beyond this, like, oh, if we only, uh, you know, can reduce our emissions, like things will be all right. I, I'm for a carbon tax and dividend. Um, I think it's great to have companies internalize the cost of mm-hmm. emissions and other negative externalities. Um, but we have to start getting more aggressive and realistic um, because as in other areas, 20 years from now, the Chinese are just going to be geoengineering right and left, truthfully. I mean, because they're going to see what's going on. And you think they're going to ask us, like, again, this is something where we have to become a leader in and then hopefully be able to work with uh, other, the other uh, advanced economies. It is an amazing to have this, uh, this conversation and to think about the technologies that we have been talking about uh, as present uh, practical things that need to be part of public policy and, and industrial investment, geoengineering, solar, uh, AI. Uh, you prob- one probably wouldn't have had that conversation with a straight face uh, even 10 years ago. Well, uh, and that is the issue. Again, we have to, to advance our government and society as quickly as possible because we are decades behind and the American people understand it. That's why they're so angry and despair ridden and desperate enough to elect a narcissist reality star as president. Um, so we, we need to start owning some of these challenges and, uh, and then addressing them. And that's going to be, you know, a massive challenge, but I have a feeling that most Americans are going to be very excited to start actually solving the problems in our midst um, instead of uh, running away from them or ignoring them. And, and that's the embarrassment of politicians right now in America. I've had these conversations they won't even acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is the, the fact that technology has changed our economy uh, forever and that we need right. to advance uh, with our technology instead of staying in the 60s and 70s and, and wishing for the past. Absolutely. No, that, that's a very, very true mess- good message and a great message, uh, I think, for the listeners as well. I, I've really enjoyed chatting to you and I, and I know we're out of time now. Um, any, any, final, any final thoughts, Pearl of Wisdom, that you've seen on your travels around the U.S. that, that give us uh, some optimism for the future? Well, I would just like to suggest to everyone who's listening to this right now, if you want to make these changes real and put them front and center in the mainstream of our political discourse in 2020, go to my website, yang2020.com. You'll see I have other policies that I have a feeling you'll agree with. Um, And let's make this real together because we do not have that much time. Time is of the essence. And we have to make the case to the people of America this year, 2019 and 2020, and start solving these problems. Andrew, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Azim. It's been great being with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Azim here. Well, as I mentioned, Andrew has a book out, The War on Normal People. I'm sure you can find it at your outlet of choice. His website is yang2020.com. That is yang2020.com. I'll be back next week with another amazing conversation. And next week's conversation is truly mind-expanding, so do look out for it. And and remember, it really helps us to reach new audiences if you share and recommend this podcast. So please do take a moment. And finally, the best way to stay in touch with me is to sign up to the weekly Wonder Missive, Exponential View. You can find it at www.exponentialview.co. That is www.exponentialview.co.